in the first century CE, three remarkable siblings were born to the prominent scholar and official Ban Biao. This was during the period known as the Eastern Han, which ranges from CE 25 to 220. We call it the Eastern Han because for this period, the Han Dynasty capital was Luoyang, in the east, as opposed to Chang'an, as previously, in the west. Our friends back then simply called it the Han. So when I use Western or Eastern Han, it's to distinguish between two time periods. And when I just say Han, I'm referring to the dynasty itself. The Western Han was a time of the centralization of political and economic power, a trend that peaked under the reign of Emperor Wu. He reigned from 141 to 87 BCE. The Eastern Han, in contrast, saw a general retreat of the government from its subjects' daily lives. Ban Biao's eldest son, Ban Gu, would pursue a life of learning that brought him fame and suspicion. Ban Gu's younger twin brother, Ban Chao, was a renowned soldier, instrumental in reasserting Han control over the Tarim Basin in present-day Xinjiang province, and projecting Chinese power out along what we now call the Silk Road. Their younger sister, Ban Zhao, was an influential scholar, teacher, and poet. Her writings helped to shape and define the role of women and of families among the elite and in the imperial court. She would complete her brother Ban Gu's groundbreaking history of the early Han, and she would codify a nuance and progressive code of conduct for women. These three remarkable siblings exemplify three critical elements of dynastic rule in China, controlling history, controlling territory, and controlling the family. The Ban clan also symbolizes the dynamic tension between family loyalty and loyalty to the emperor. In year nine of the Common Era, the Han Dynasty was overthrown by a man named Wang Mang who founded a dynasty called the Xin, a word that literally means new or renewed. No peasant rebel, Wang Mang had lived a life of privilege at court. His aunt was Wang Junjun. She'd been the beloved and beautiful consort to the emperor Yuan, who reigned from 48 to 33 BCE. During the quarter century reign of her son, Emperor Cheng, Wang Junjun wielded considerable power as Empress Dowager, the mother of the emperor, packing the court with members of her family, the Wang lineage. Emperor Cheng died in 7 BCE, leaving no heir. The new emperor, Ai Di, was confronted by an intense power struggle between the ladies of the imperial household. At one point, four different women claimed the title of Empress Dowager. Emperor Ai, who was openly gay, died in 1 BCE, also leaving no heir. Wang Junjun leapt into action. She placed her nine-year-old step-grandson on the throne. Her nephew Wang Mang was given command of the imperial guard and of the military commanderies around the imperial capital. Wang Mang dissolved the Han Dynasty late in 8 CE and accepted the imperial throne early the next year. Considered a cold-blooded tyrant by some and a romantic idealist by others, Wang Mang claimed to be returning, of renewing the empire, returning to the traditions of the semi-mythic Zhou Dynasty that was founded around 1046 BCE. In Wang's mind, he was rebooting the corrupted dynastic hardware and software of the 1st century CE back to its pure form of the 11th century BCE. Wang reinstituted the Zhou system of titles. He recalled all the currencies out in circulation in the whole empire and replaced it with his own elaborate coinage based on the model of the Zhou dynasty. And most significantly, he eliminated private ownership of land. He made all land the property of the emperor. 
Wang Mang's policies quickly unraveled, and his short-lived Xin dynasty succumbed to a lethal combination of elite resistance and peasant rebellion. A minor branch of the family of the previous Han emperors, the Liu clan, toppled Wang Mang and restored the Han dynasty in 25 CE. So begins what we call the Eastern Han. The Ban clan, with whom I began this lecture, had made their fortunes in the livestock business, but they owed much of their power and privilege to a woman about whom we know little, the consort Ban. We do know that she was the daughter of a court official and concubine to Wang Junjun's son, the Emperor Cheng. She was erudite and renowned for her poetry. Her erudition, in fact, helped save her brother from a charge of treason, and as a result, he lived to father a son, a son named Ban Biao. So this nephew of consort Ban, Ban Biao, well, he was born near the Western Han capital of Chang'an and served the Eastern Han from its new capital at Luoyang. He was an historian and biographer. And Ban Biao, as historian and biographer, was critical of a very, very distinguished, very famous predecessor. That was the Western Han's greatest historian and biographer, Sima Qian, author of the Shi Ji the records of the grand historian, perhaps China's greatest work of history. Ban Biao thought that Sima Qian had paid insufficient attention to the moral qualities of his subjects, focusing instead on their audacious achievements. Ban Biao felt that history and biography needed to emphasize Confucian virtue, especially because the great and the virtuous were not often the same people. Ban Biao's twin sons, Ban Gu and Ban Chao, were born in 32 CE, and his daughter, Ban Zhao, in 45. The firstborn twin, Ban Gu, followed closest in his father's scholarly footsteps. So let's start with him. He was a promising young scholar and, and studied at the Imperial Academy at Luoyang. When his father died in 54 CE, Ban Gu, holding true to Confucian precepts, abandoned his official duties and returned to the Ban estate to observe a three-year period of mourning. Ban Gu locked himself away in the family's great library to read and reread his father's biographical and historical essays. He emerged committed to writing a morally-centered history of the Western Han to counter Sima Qian's bias for the powerful. Ban Gu's Han Shu, or Book of the Han, is the first example of what we call a dynastic history. It covers the span from the fall of the Qin in 206 BCE to the fall of Wang Mang in 25 CE. By contrast, Sima Qian had written a sweeping history covering everything from the mythic past all the way up to the early emperors of the Han Dynasty. Dynastic histories are didactic. They retrospectively examine the preceding dynasty's rise and fall, its strengths and weaknesses, its heroes and villains, so that the new dynasty, the dynasty currently in power, can use this contrasting example as a mirror, a mirror for good and virtuous governance. But Bangu's account was subtly different from most dynastic histories. First, he lived in the dynasty he was writing about. And second, he believed that the Liu family, the, the, the clan that currently occupied the Han Dynasty throne, held something the ancient Confucians had called the Mandate of Heaven. And so, if they remained sufficiently virtuous, they could retain this divine right to rule for all eternity. And Bangu drew no distinction between the Western and Eastern Han. These are later labels that we use. Instead, Bangu glorified and legitimized the restored Han by contrasting its virtues and genius to the less than perfect performance and moral failings of its Western Han predecessor and of Wang Mang's short lived Xin dynasty. This didactic mirroring infuses Bangu's historiography and even his poetry. But Bangu had begun this morally judgmental history of the Han Dynasty 
on his own initiative, without approval or oversight from those who had the most to gain or lose by it, that is, the rulers of the Han Dynasty themselves. When the authorities found out what Banggu was up to, he was arrested, and his notes and library were confiscated. He was spared the death penalty, and instead assigned to an imperial think tank where his research could be supervised and his skills directed towards approved topics. After several years of scrutiny and probation, the emperor relented and allowed Banggu to return to his history of the Western Han. To get a sense of where Banggu stood on governance and morality, let's take a look at two of his writings. One, an essay called The Treatise on Food and Money, and a second, a literary piece called A Rhapsody, or Fu, The Fu on the Two Capitals. The Treatise on Food and Money is an economic history of China from the Zhou Dynasty, from around the 11th century BCE uh, to the 1st century CE. And it's a critique of the economic policies of the early Han. It resonates closely with the small government arguments of a group called the Confucians, as recorded in a Western Han policy debate called the Discourses on Salt and Iron. In that debate, the Confucians opposed government intrusion in the economy. Banggu, in his essay, reasons that economic and agrarian policies are best when, the, when kept simple and non-invasive. The more the government tries to extract money and labor service from farmers, the worse the farmers perform, and the worse the economy gets. He draws attention to the simple and beneficial agrarian and monetary policies employed by ancient China's founders, the, the virtuous monarchs of the distant past. Their policies, he contended, enriched the people and equalized wealth to a far greater degree than did the more invasive and extractive policies of the recent past. Banggu was implicitly endorsing the less invasive policies of the Eastern Han, the, the rulers of the dynasty he's living in at the time. A dynasty that had been restored with the significant help of wealthy landholders and merchants who wanted to keep the state at bay. He was also trying to tie the hands of future rulers who might consider returning to the policies of, say, the late emperor Han Wu Di or the, the wayward Wang Mang. The Fu on the two capitals is equally laden with suggestions about how the Han ought to be ruled. It glorifies and endorses a major policy decision. That is, moving the capital from the uncouth and militarized West into the cultured and Confucian East. It's a debate poem. Two worthies are challenged to make their case for the superiority of Chang'an or Luoyang, respectively. The gentleman from Chang'an, I'll let you in on a secret, he's destined to lose the debate, well, he gets to go first. His rhapsody, his fu, on the former capital depicts it as a superficially grand, but he doesn't know this, He's revealing that it's a subtly and fundamentally flawed testament to imperial hubris. By comparison, the, the advocate for Luoyang makes us understand that it mirrors the capitals of the distant past. It's a city like the sage kings would have built, with its perfect harmony of palaces and temples. So there you have it. Chang'an is a city of excess, of arrogance, of imperial overreach. Luoyang, though, is a beacon of frugality and moderation. The policy retreat from an interventionist approach and a physical retreat from west to east, policies that Banggu both endorsed, created some major strategic challenges, though, for the Eastern Han. And when you know it, the man who did the most to overcome those challenges was none other than Banggu's twin brother, Ban Chao. We often get the impression that imperial China generally favored civil governance over military might, the one over the Wu, and that the Chinese elite generally disparaged service in the military. Ban Chao's career, however, alerts us to the reality that for much of China's imperial history, the best and brightest saw military service on par with scholarship and with, with service in the civil bureaucracy. While Banggu followed one noble path to respect and influence as a scholar official, 
His brother Ban Chao followed an equal trajectory in terms of import and impact as a soldier. Ban Chao's career also highlights the strategic challenges the Eastern Han confronted. During the Qin and early Han periods, the nomad warriors known collectively as the Xiongnu, you might know them as the Huns, were a powerful and threatening presence along the empire's Central Asian frontiers. Early Han policy was called He Qin, literally peace and kinship, or peace through kinship. Gifts of gold and girls, princesses in particular, were exchanged for peace. The emperor Han Wudi jettisoned that policy and attempted to build, uh, sorry, attempted to deliver a decisive blow to the Xiongnu and to extend Chinese power further into the Tarim Basin in, in modern-day Xinjiang province. Those campaigns had mixed results. In the first century CE, the Xiongnu uh, were divided and significantly weakened. The southern Xiongnu had, in fact, become allies and dependents of the Han, while the northern Xiongnu remained hostile to the Han. The political chaos of the short-lived Xin usurpation, followed by the Han restoration, enabled several Western tribes to expand and challenge Han hegemony in Central Asia. But by the 70s CE, the Han was ready to strike back. The challenge it confronted was to maintain the security of its Western frontiers without actually having firm control of the territory around the old capital of Chang'an, a region, a region known as Guangzhou. By this time, Guangzhou was awash with unruly Central Asian tribesmen and their feuding chieftains. They had been brought into the dynasty by earlier emperors. The Han also had to maintain a presence in Central Asia without the money and manpower that aggressive fiscal policies like the salt and iron monopoly employed by the Western, uh, by the Western Han had made available to its emperors and generals. This was the challenge confronting Ban Chao when he took command of the Han forces in the Tarim Basin in 73 CE. He remained there for the next 30 years, culminating in a decade-long tenure as protector of the Western regions. When it came to dealing with the troublesome northern Xiongnu, Ban Chao's strategy was ingenious in the near term, but somewhat problematic in the long term. He cultivated, or, or in some cases bought, allies, allies among the frontier tribes, and relied increasingly on a small Chinese expeditionary army bulked up with nomad mercenaries. Fan Chao's biography is rich in details of deals made, alliances built and broken, money passed and enemies outwitted. By the end of the first century, he had expelled the northern Xiongnu from the Tarim Basin, and operating out of a garrison at Dunhuang in modern Gansu province, he'd established Han military colonies as far west as Kashgar. At the same time, the region's tribal chieftains were now competing for the fancy titles the Han emperor bestowed on them. Sadly, at nearly the same time as Ban Chao's greatest strategic achievements, his brother Ban Gu, the scholar, once again fell out of favor at court and died in prison. But back in Central Asia, Ban Chao's strategy of allying with frontier tribes and advancing with a small expeditionary army was a remarkable success in the near term. But it was built on somewhat shaky foundations. For one, Central Asians were beginning, were beginning to outnumber native Chinese in Guangzhou deep inside the empire, and out on the frontier, maintaining the delicate balance of manipulation, money, and military might that Ban Chao had pulled off in the Tarim Basin and beyond, required a successor who was up to that daunting task. After Ban Chao's death in 102, that task fell to his very capable son, Ban Yong, who managed to keep the western regions under a modicum of Han control. But after he was recalled in the 120s, that control evaporated. As an aside, Ban Chao's tenure in Central Asia marked the height of Sino-Roman connectivity over the Silk Road. It was a period of significant, albeit indirect, east-west trade. 
Panchao had, in fact, sent out expeditions to scout to the west of the Tarim Basin. They reached as far as the Caspian Sea and maybe even to the Persian Gulf. But it's doubtful that Chinese emissaries met any Romans. It's exciting to think of these two great empires linking up over the Silk Road, but their connections were distant. At most, it was tall tales that these two peoples knew about each other. I should also let you in on a little secret. Actually, not a little secret, it's a fairly big secret. Uh, the, The Chinese never referred to the winding networks through the oases of Central Asia as the Silk Road. That's a that's a European phrase from the 19th century. Initial Chinese interest in the area, in addition, was primarily strategic, not commercial. Gifts of silk, along with cash and tea, uh, were ways to buy security and also to buy horses. They they weren't primarily about expanding trade. Nonetheless, as Chinese interests and alliances multiplied and extended into Central Asia, Chinese silks were sold and resold and resold further west, where they came into the hands of Persian and Arab caravan merchants, who then sold them on to Roman traders. So, Banchao's frontier strategy and expeditionary forays contributed to the development of what we know as the Silk Road. In other words, this great trade network uh, was in part the unintentional consequence of a series of defense contracts. Banchao and his three decades in Central Asia did a great deal to enhance the power and prestige of the Han Dynasty. We can tell this from the fabulous gifts that he, he forwarded to the Han court and from the exotica available in Han markets. In Chinese statecraft, a powerful dynasty should be a magnet for strange birds and beasts from the far corners of the world. It's a a demonstration of its gravitational pull of hard and soft power. It should exercise gravitational pull on the most exotic products available. So it's not surprising that in 101 CE, Ban Chao presented a Parthian ostrich to the imperial court. The emperor asked Ban Chao's sister, Ban Zhao, to compose a poem to commemorate the event. Her rhapsody, Fu, on the great bird, exalts the virtues of an emperor who's attracted such a magnificent tribute. She writes, He comes 10,000 li on his great wings to rest at the imperial court. He roams at ease, rejoicing in its air of harmony. From east, west, north, and south, all come eager to submit. Ban Zhao was a remarkable person who made a significant impact on Chinese culture and society. And she deserves our attention every bit as much as her brothers. She's also an important corrective to a more stereotypical, unfortunate tendency to view Imperial China's most notable women as something often referred to as white-boned demons, once beautiful maidens who have slept, manipulated, and murdered their way to the top. The powerful and scheming Wang Junjun, whom we met earlier, is usually cast as one of these archetypes, these murderous manipulators, these white-boned demons. But in reality, there was a good space for the women of imperial China between the extremes of, say, the white-boned demon and, and simply victims of oppression. Ban Zhao, like many women, married young, at age 14. It was a strategic marriage, arranged to build alliances between great clans. And if she ever met the groom before the wedding, it would have been a very brief encounter. Ban Zhao started out on the lowest rung in her new home, as the young bride to a young son. She wrote extensively on how a young wife could and should assiduously court the favor of her new in-laws, especially her new mother-in-law. Ban Zhao bore several children, including at least one son, whose arrival as a male heir increased her stock within her husband's family. But her husband died young. The death of a husband presented most wives with a stark choice. Be disloyal to his memory remarry and abandon her children to her husband's family. Or she could stay with her children and remain the perpetually chaste and loyal widow. Ban Zhao's wealth allowed her to chart a course between these extremes. She never remarried, and her devotion to her children and loyalty to her late husband have made her an exemplar of wifely virtue. 
But she was never a prisoner in her late husband's home. She traveled, wrote, and socialized within the highest circles of the Han elite. At the time, Ban Chao uh, penned the rhapsody about the Parthian ostrich. She was a celebrated writer in her mid-50s. Born into the highest strata of Han society, her parents had provided her with a first-class education and access to a family library that would have been the envy of every cultured male in the Han, in the Han dynasty. And her talents brought her powerful connections within the imperial clan. Besides her scholarly and poetic contributions, Ban Chao is best known for a treatise she wrote called the Nu Jie, or Admonitions for Women. At first glance, the admonitions will strike a modern audience as deeply sexist. It, it offers a series of injunctions to keep women in their place and subservient to men. It begins as follows. I, the unworthy writer, am unsophisticated, unenlightened, and by nature, unintelligent. Later she writes, Let a woman modestly yield to others. Let her put others first, herself last. And Always let her seem to tremble and fear. And the fact that Ban Chao peppers her essay with references to Confucian classics makes it sound like she was trying to philosophically confine women in the same way that many women were physically confined. But we should ask ourselves, is, is Ban Chao trying to keep women in their place? Or is she creating a place, a place of power and influence for women to legitimize and to guide the power that women could and did wield within the family and even within larger society? I believe it's more the latter. But I wouldn't call Ban Zhao a feminist. Let's keep her in the context of her time. To her, men and women, like yin and yang, were fundamentally different. In nature, the yin forces, the feminine and yielding, must be equal to the young, the bold and masculine, for there to be harmony in the home and in society. So if a man was to develop a reputation for talent and virtue, he must have the aid of women of talent and virtue, mothers, wives, sisters, and daughters. Among all of Ban Chao's admonitions to women, to be meek and mild, to wash and scrub, to sew and weave, this one stands out to me most. The gentlemen, she says, the gentlemen of the present age think only of controlling their wives. They think only of teaching their sons to read books and to study history. This ignores the essential relation between men and women, and it is not in accord with the teaching of the sages. In other words, she's saying if we fail to educate women, we'll create a fundamentally a fundamentally unbalanced society. Ban Zhao's audience consisted principally of the Han's elite clans, including the imperial family, for whom discord within the family, particularly between the male and female sides, could, as we've seen already, spell dynastic disaster. When Ban Zhao's eldest brother Ban Gu died in prison, she ded dedicated her considerable talents to revising and finishing his epic history. By the late 90s CE, she was a fixture at the imperial court in, in uh, Luoyang, engaging in scholarly debates, advising empresses, and educating the women of the imperial household, and, and probably not a few of the young men as well, and composing rhapsodies at the emperor's request. She remained a trusted advisor to the imperial family until her death in 116, when the, the emperor and empress themselves observed a period of mourning for this elegant and eloquent individual. All three Ban children were instrumental in hitting the reset button on the Han dynasty after the trauma of usurpation and restoration. And each of them provided models of how the empire could be unified, governed, and even expanded with greater balance. The eldest, Ban Gu, used history to support his earnest and unsubtle admonitions about the importance of limited government and conservative monetary and agrarian policies. In the field, the soldier, Ban Chao, developed a mixed model of violence, bribery, and diplomacy to control territory and to extend Han hegemony with a relatively modest expenditure of blood and treasure. And their younger sister, Ban Zhao, 
developed a domestic model of balance between the sexes that could be applied broadly to harmonize society. It's no wonder that the three children of Ban Biao stand out in the history of imperial China.